Okay. Let's go. Right. So, um, so last time we defined dimension of a set, a definable set, and we defined it as the maximum of the sum of the i1 up to in such that it contains an i1 up to in cell. And we were about, well, we were about to prove the second part of the proposition. So what we were going to prove was um, invariance of dimension under definable by fictions. So I have a, ah, so perhaps recall what's our set do. I have an O minimal expansion of a field. Pen. Okay, and then what were we going to prove? So proposition, if I have a definable set in M to the M and uh, a definable set in M to the M, and I have a bijection that's definable, uh, little f. Um, then x and y have the same dimension. Okay, so let's prove it. Well, so what do we need to prove? Let's see. Um, let's say that D is dim X, E is dim Y. Um, then it's enough to show D is less than or equal to E because then I can take the inverse. So we show D less than or equal to E. So uh, D is the dimension of X, so that means that X contains um, an I1 up to IN cell where I1 up to IN sum to D. So let C contained in X be an I1 up to IM cell with D the sum. Um, so then I've got F sends X to Y, um, and I can compose that with a definable bijection from C to M to the D um, to get a definable bijection from M to the, sorry, a definable injective function from uh, M to the D to Y. So composing, with a definable bijection, uh, C to M to the D, we get a definable injective G from M to the D to Y. Um, so now we'll sell decompose one. So then why is the union of so those cells? So I take the pre-image on the G, and so M to the D is the union of the pre images um, so, so one of these must contain an open cell. Because their union is M to the D. So some G inverse of CI contains an open cell D in M to the D. Let's say, say it's G1, uh, sorry, C1. So D is contained in G inverse of C1. And then 
C1 is a so C1 is a cell in Y, so it's an M to the N. So J1 up to J N cell. And if what we're trying to prove is that D is less than or equal to E. So if these J's sum to something bigger than D, we're done. So let's suppose that they don't. Um, so for a contradiction. Suppose uh, that D is bigger than the sum. And let's call that E prime. Um, so we have, uh, we go from D to C1 by G, and then by a bijection, a definable bijection to M to the E prime. Right, C1 is a, a, a J1 up to J N cell where they sum to E prime, so it's in definable bijection with M to the E prime. Um, so so uh, that's a definable uh, injective function. Let's call it H prime. So then, I can, then we get, I can view M to the E prime as sitting inside M to the D because E prime is less than D. Um, H2 prime from D to M to the E prime times zero, where zero is in M to the D minus E prime. So, and this is definable in injective. So then we have a um, an open cell D in M to the D and a definable injective map from that open cell to M to the D. And we proved last time that, that the image then has to contain an open cell and it doesn't here. Um, so since D is open, this contradicts the lemma that we proved last time. So our notion of dimension is invariant under definable bijections, and so, so it's the right notion of dimension. Um, okay, and we're gonna spend most of the day proving more things about it. Um, so first, like it behaves very nicely in that you can look at fibers where you have a certain dimension and the, you get additivity of the dimension. So let's state that. Um, so suppose I have x in m to the m times m to the n definable. And I have some d that could be the dimension of a fiber, so it's less than or equal to n. Then the set of points over which the fiber has that di dimension is definable. Uh, so then let's call that xd. So that's the x in m to the n, such that when I take the fiber over that point, the dimension is my given d. So this is definable. And when I look at the dimension of x, the, the, the dimension of the part of x that lies over this xd, that part of x has dimension, dimension of this plus d. So, and so the part of X that lies over this is this. It's the union of X times the fiber where X varies in X D. And the dimension of that is the dimension of X D plus D. Okay, so let's prove this. Um, so let's take 
the cell decomposition of the ambient space compared to the wave aerics. So if C in there, so C is in D, uh, is an I1 up to I M plus N cell, then its projection down to um, M to the N is an I1 up to I M cell. And each fiber, um, and for uh, let's see, and CX is an I M plus one up to I M plus N cell for all X in the, in the projection. Uh, each x in pi of c. Uh, so here, pi is projection onto the first m coordinates. Okay, so this is something you can check. Um, so what does this tell us? So that the dimension of C is the sum of these. So it is the dimension of, uh, it is the sum of these plus the sum of these. So it's the dimension of pi of C plus dimension of fiber. Um, so dimension of C is dim pi of C plus dim Cx. Uh, for each x in pi of c. So now take take a, a cell in the projection of the cell decomposition. So fix c prime uh, one of the cells that we get by projecting all the cells in d, and then take all of the cells over that that live in x. So let's call those C1 up to CK uh, in D, B uh, cells in X, contained in X, whose projection is C prime. So then if I take um, a point in the projection and I fiber X over that point, that fiber is the union of the fibers of the C I's. So then uh, for X and C prime, the fiber is the union of the fibers of the cells. So then by what we proved last time, remember the dimension of a union is the maximum of the dimensions. So when I take the dimension of the fiber, that's the maximum of the dimensions of these. Now for each of these, each of these is equal to the dimension of um, CI minus the dimension of the projection by star here. So this is equal to the max of uh, dim CI minus uh, dim. So the projection is C prime. So that's by star. Uh, 
But this here doesn't depend on X, right? This doesn't depend where we fiber. Um, so let D be this max. Then this cell C prime, I say, then the fiber has to mention D for all X in C prime. So that means C prime is contained in XD. So if C prime is one of the cells where when you do this, you get D, then C prime is contained in XD. And then XD is a finite union of cells, so it's definable. So that's the uh, the definability part here, you know, here. And then what we want is this formula. Um, so let's see. Uh, we have d is equal to the max of the dimension of the ci minus dimension of C prime. This one is the um, dimension of the union of the CI. And this union is the part of X that lies over um, uh, C prime. So this is um, X times C I X. Uh, the union of those over C prime. So we get this dimension is D plus this one. Um, and then I take the union in of, of these, the C prime varies over the finitely many cells um, contained in XD. So then taking the union over all C prime in pi of D with C prime contained in X of D, well, we get that the we get what we want. <laughs> the result, because on this side, we'll get the mention of the part of X that lies over XD. And on this side, we'll get the D plus the maximum dimension of the C primes. And that dimension of the C prime, the maximum one is the dimension of XD. And so we get what we want. Okay, um, so then there's a corollary to this, which um, kind of gives a more general form of this. So let me type write that down. So it's got several bits. Um, so in the setting of the proposition, uh, Dimension of X is the maximal dimension of the different parts lying over the different XDs. So max um, dim XD plus D uh, for zero less than or equal to D less than or equal to N. And that's greater than or equal to the dimension of the projection of X. Uh, the second one, is, is a generalization where instead of projection, we take a general definable map. So suppose 
x is an entity n, and I have a definable map to entity n, then I can take, so instead of the xd from before, we could use the f. So we take the, the points in, x, in entity m where the fiber has dimension d. So let's call that xfd. Uh, so the xd is the x pi of d. Then um, this is definable. We get the same formula as before. Uh, so dim x is, uh, sorry, the part, the pre image of xf. So that's the part of, that's like the part of x that lies over xd. Um, that has dimension, the dimension of xfd plus d. And dmx is at least dmf of x. And then there's a special case where you take products if x is in m to the n, y is in m to the n, definable, then dim the product is the sum of the dimensions. Okay, so this one I'll leave as an exercise. Um, so I think one and one is easy. Two, you apply the previous thing to the graph, and then it's easy. And three is a special case. Um, and then also as an exercise, so this is left as an exercise. Also, as an exercise is to show the following. Um, Suppose I have two sets in M to the one plus N. Um, the second one is not empty. Suppose that for each X in M, either uh, the fiber over X is empty or has smaller dimension uh, than the fiber over Y. Then dim X is less than dim Y. And we'll use this in a minute. So what we're going to do next is we're going to show that if I have a non-empty set, the dimension of the frontier, which is the closure of x minus x, uh, dimension of the frontier is less than x. And we'll use this, and we need another lemma, um, which I will prove. So what does that one say? That says, suppose I have uh, x in a definable set in n to the one plus n. And then I look at the set of x in m such that when I take the closure of the fiber, that's not the same as the fiber of the closure. Okay, so the, the lemma says that this set's finite. So what do these what, what what are these points like? Let's try and draw a picture. Um, so maybe here's here's x. So it's all of this and this curve there. It only goes up to the it's an open bit of curve. Um, then uh, here over this point, the fiber is just this bit just the bit between the two curves. Um, so the closure is just this bit. Whereas when you take the closure of the whole thing and you fiber over X, you get this point in it too. Um, 
but on the other bits, <laughs> the rest of the time, the fiber of the closure, the closure of the fiber are the same. Okay, so it's probably not a very helpful picture, but there we go. Okay, so proof. Um, so let's see, we always have this one contained in this one, right? So note that the closure of the fiber is contained in the closure, in the fiber of the closure. Um, let's suppose that this set is infinite. Uh, so this set, oh, this set. And so it's definable. So if it's infinite, it contains an integral. Um, then contains an open integral i. Now, um, by the definition of the set, if I take a point in I, um, so for each X in I, there's an open box witnessing that they're different. Um, so there is uh, an open box B in M to the N such that so what should we have? This is proper, this should be proper. So, um, sorry, this, I forget that you can't see where I'm pointing. <laughs> uh, so such that um, B doesn't intersect the fiber uh, and B does intersect the fiber of the closure. Okay, now the family of boxes in open boxes in M to the N is a definable family. So I've got for each X, there's one of these boxes. So by definable choice, I can get the box as a definable function of my X. Um, so family of open boxes in M to the N is definable. Um, and then, so for each X, there is a box. And then so by definable choice, um, we get B or set one such B as a definable function of X. Now, by monotonicity, we can then assume that, that function is continuous. Yes. Um, and then I take U to be the X, Y in I times M to the N such that Y is in the box over X. And then what do I have? Well, U's open. Um, in I times M to the N and doesn't intersect X by, by this here. But it does intersect um, the closure. Uh, and that's impossible, so that's a contradiction. Uh, so, so our set is fine after all. Uh, 
Okay, and then using that, we can do this results up effectively. So what is that result? Theorem. Um, so suppose I have X uh, a non empty definable set. Then um, dimension of the frontier of X is less than dimension of X. So recall frontier of X um, is closure X minus X. So in particular, the closure of X and X have the same dimension. Uh, so this gets used a lot in, in inductive arguments, this result. You can, yeah. Um, so I, I think Kobe will use this a lot in his part of this course later. Um, okay, so we'll prove it by induction on the Cambian dimension. And the results okay for n equals one, so n equals one is okay. So let's suppose x is in um, m to the n plus one, and that the result holds for m to the n. Or for subsets of m to the n. Okay, so um, for each of the coordinates, consider this set. So let closure i, so it's going to be the points in m to the m plus one, such that x lies in the closure uh, of x intersected with the, um, the coordinate plane whose ith coordinate is the same as x. So that's that's this where pi i is projection onto the ith coordinate. So this is a subset of the closure. Now, suppose I, um, let's take, work with I is one. So suppose I have a point in the closure that's not in closure sub one of X. Okay, then, well, what does that mean then? So I can write X as like X1, X prime um, with uh, X prime in the closure of X, the fiber of the closure and X prime not in the closure of the fiber. So by the lemma, we just did, there's only finitely many possible X ones. So. Only finitely many possible X ones by the lemma. So what does that mean? That means that this difference lies in um, a finite union of hyperplanes, um, all with each of which projects onto uh, a single point under pi one. So uh, that is, there exist points A11 up to A1, K1 in, M, 
touch that. And the difference. Uh, lies in the hyperplanes over those points. So the union of pi one inverse of a one j um but then I can do this with one replaced by i for each i from one up to n plus one by permuting coordinates. Um, so permuting coordinates we get for each, well, for i from two up to uh, uh, k, uh, sorry, for the remaining i, so from two up to n plus one, we get uh, a bunch of a's, so a i one up to a i k i, so, so this thing here holds, I can do this. So we get the same thing, but with one replaced by I. Um, And then all these planes are orthogonal, the different eyes. So that means that the um, the closure minus the union of these closures contained in the intersection of the planes um, well, is contained in the finite set. Uh, a um, one I one uh, J one a n J n oh n plus one where J one is one up to uh, K one J n plus one is one up to K n plus one. So the difference between this closure and this union is a finite set. Um, and then it follows from the what we proved about the dimension of the union. Uh, um, that the dimension of the closure of X minus X is less than or equal to the maximum as the dimension of uh, the um, like the I closure minus X uh, and zero. So that reduces us to showing, well, so we'll show that this has dimension uh, less than X for each I. Um, so we show, we next show, The dim closure i minus um, x, closure i of x minus x is less than dim x for each i. So let's take i equals one uh, and, and some point a and m. Then, if I look at uh, the dimension of the closure of X intersect the fiber over A, um, X intersect the hyperplane over A, uh, and I take away X intersect the hyperplane over A. That's less than dim 
x intersect the hyperplane as long as this is non-empty by the inductive hypothesis. Um, so or dim x into the hyperplane is empty. So by the inductive hypothesis. Because we can identify this hyperplane with m to the n, and we know that the result for, for subsets of m to the n. Um, okay, so then uh, let's see. Uh, this set here, uh, this whole thing. is equal to um, the one closure of x minus x intersect the hyperplane. Um, so that means we have so for each a with uh, X intersect pi one inverse of a not empty. We have uh, that the dimension of uh, closure one. Minus x intersected with the hyperplane over a is less than the dimension of x intersect the hyperplane over a. Then I can identify this with the fiber over a. Um, so this with the fiber of closure one of x minus x, and this with the fiber of x. Uh, that's for each other again. Um, and then by the exercise, that means that, so this set has dimension less than this at slacks. So by the exercise, Okay, so then I can permute coordinates and get this for each i. So we also get this for i from two up to n plus one. Um, so then, uh, What do we have? We had we had this here, and we now know that all of these are less than dim x. So either this is less than dim x, or uh, dim x is zero. Um, so either dim closure x minus x less than dim x or dim x is zero. Um, but if, if dim x is zero, x is closed. So then we're done anyway. Um, well, then x is finite. So closed. And we're done.
Okay, so, um, okay, so the next section is going to be a bit different. Um, so uh, we're going to do dimension again. Well, we're going to we introduce another notion of dimension and show that it is the same as the one we've got. Um, so, we're going to do it by model theory. Um, and we're doing this because Kobe needs this for his bit of the, the course. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll define another dimension function, um, which I'm also going to write by dim x. Uh, and that's okay because we're also going to prove that it's the same as what we got. So let's see, we still have um, a no minimum expansion of a field. And so Recall that if I have a subset of my M, uh, the model theoretic algebraic closure is the union of all the finite. Um, so the model theoretic algebraic closure of A is the union of all the finite A definable sets. Okay, so if A is a subset of M, then the, the model theoretic algebraic closure of A is the union of all finite A definable. So that means definable in M with parameters from A. Um, uh, finite A definable subsets of M. Um, and it's so the, throughout this section, we need to be careful with parameters. So I'm going to be more precise than I have been. Um, uh, so that's the algebraic closure. And then, uh, and there's a definable closure, the definable closure of A. Is the union of all singletons as a divisible for A. Um, all A definable singletons now because we have the ordering in our language if I have a finite subset of M I can say I'm either the least one or I'm the second to least one, and so on. So these things coincide in our setting. Because of the ordering, um, these coincide. That is, we have ACL. A equals DCL. A. So we're just going to work with this DCL. Now, um, uh, so easy properties. If I have a subset, um, then, well, A is contained in the DCL. And um, I can just say I'm equal to A. Um, the definable closure of the definable closure is the definable closure. Um, so for that, you can use the definable, A definable function to close on the composition. Um, and then the definable closure is the same as taking the union of all the definable closures of finite subsets of A. So, uh, so this is called a finite character. You can you can witness being in the definable closure by a finite subset, or by being in the definable closure of finite subsets. So it's the DCL 
uh, the union of the DCLs of A1 up to AN, where N is just a natural number, and A1 up to AN are elements of A. And then the non-trivial property is what's called the exchange number. So it's a theorem. So this is called exchange. Uh, so this is due to the next time. Uh, I guess 1986. It's in the the first definable sets in audit structures paper. So what does it say? Suppose I have a subset of M and a couple of elements. Um, if if I have B in the definable closure of A together with little A but not in the definable closure of A, then I can swap them around. Then A must be in the definable closure of B together with little a. Um, So this is an abstract version of what you get in like linear algebra, field theory, and so on. Um, uh, okay, so let's prove this, and then I'll talk about it. So proof. So this is going to follow from the monotistic theorem that we proved. Um, so I can add constants for the elements of A, so I can suppose that A is the empty set. I can suppose A is empty. So then I have B is in the definable closure of singleton A, and it's not in the definable closure of the empty set. So what, what does it mean to be in the definable closure? It means that there's a definable function um, which takes A to B. Well, there's a definable function on, defined on some subset of M, an A definable function where A is in the domain and it takes A to B. So, um, since um, oh, sorry, that should be not in, not in the DCL of zero. So since B is in DCL of A, there is a, ah, a is zero, so an empty set definable function. F with uh, A in the domain of F, domain of F contained in M, such that F of A is B. So what? The domain of F is a, is a definable set. It's a zero definable, an empty set definable set. Um, so that means that um, it's a finite union of empty set definable points and empty set definable intervals. Mm -hmm. So since DOM F is empty set definable, is a finite union um, of M set definable points, and M set definable open intervals. Now, if A were one of the points, then A would be zero definable. And then B is in the definable closure A. So B would be zero definable, and it's not. Um, so 
if a is one of the points, one of the zero defined points, then a is zero definable and hence so is B. Um, so we can assume that the domain of F is a zero defined local. Yeah. I. Oh, yeah, with I. And then I can apply monotonicity so that I can um, I get finitely many intervals which cover uh, I except for finitely many points. And each of those intervals is zero definable. And on each of those intervals, F is either constant or strictly monotonic. Um, so by monotonicity, um, we can assume that. So I can replace I with one of those intervals because A can't be one of the endpoints. F is strictly monotonic on I or constant on I. Um, well, if it's constant, On I, well then, uh, let's see, B is F of A. A is in the interval, and the, the function is constant on that interval, so that's the same as F of the um, midpoint of I. And the midpoint of I is, is definable from nothing, because I is definable from nothing, F is definable from nothing, so then B is zero set definable. Um, so that B is zero definable. So F's not constant, so it's strictly monotonic. And then um, uh, then I can take its inverse, right? And then F inverse. Of B is A. And so um, A is defined from B. Which is what we wanted to show. So having these properties, the, the easy ones here, and exchange means that definable closure is what's called a pre-job tree. Um, so, so this I exchange together with the easy properties. shows that DCL is a pre-geometry uh, in any model N of the theory of M. Um, and when you have a pre-geometry, you get a notion of dimension. Um, here it is. Uh, so suppose I have a set of parameters and, um, and a point. We define the dimension of our point over A to be the minimum uh, cardinality 
have a subtuple of A uh, such that the rest of A is in the definable closure of that subtuple. Um, so minimum cardinality of a subtuple A prime of A such that uh, A is in DCL of A union A prime to the end. Um, and there's another characterization we need. So um, call, call a set X in M independent over uh, A if um, if there's no elements in X which are in the definable closure of the rest. Um, so if for every X in X, that X is not in the definable closure of a union X with little X removed. Okay, then, then this dimension here, is the same as the maximal um, dimension, no, maximal cardinality of a subtuple, which is independent. Um, then, uh, dim A over A is equal to cardinality of a maximal. Um, independent over A uh, subtuple of A. So this way. Okay, so then um Using this dimension, we can define the dimension of a definable set. Um, and then we have a choice. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is assume that my structure is, is saturated enough that, that it has lots, there, there are lots of points in it. <laughs> so what do I mean? I'm going to assume M is sufficiently saturated Uh, and that all, all my sets of parameters are small relative to the saturation of M. And you don't need to do this. I'll tell you what you can do instead. It's, it's just easier if you do. Um, okay, so with that in place, we can make the following definition. Um, so suppose I have a definable set. over some small set of parameters, um, then I put the dimension of X to be the, um, the, the maximal dimension of a point in X. Uh, and then X is maximum of the dimensions of A over A, where A is a point in X. But this is like if you have a, an algebraic subvariety of some power of C uh, defined over the rationals, it's dimension you can take to be, um, you look at all the points in it and you take the point with maximal transcendence theory over Q and that's going to be the dimension of the variety. Um, 
and the Q is small compared to C, um, and that's what you need. Um, so if you don't have saturation, these points might not exist. So instead, what you do is you quantify over all elementary extensions as well. Um, and that's not as convenient as having the points there, um, but it works. I mean, you can, the same things will be true. Um, but it, it, having saturation is just a convenient thing to me that we don't need to move to bigger models. Um, okay, so I'm using the same notation, and that's because we're going to prove it's the same as what we had before. Um, okay, so there's a, an issue here. That Sorry, is, Gareth. Yes. Your, the, set, the set A is just a set, it's not definable, right? That's right. A is a set of parameters, something like, I don't know, um, like Q with E in it as well. Q will join E in, in C. Um, <laughs> So that's not okay. going to be that's not going to be a definable set in C. Um, okay, thank you. Set of parameters. Um, uh, okay, so then the, yeah, there's the issue of whether this actually depends on A or not. Right, this this definition appears to have a, a big A in it, but it doesn't. Um, so this doesn't depend on A. Um, as long as as long as you take a small set, um, you see. If I took A to B, I mean, if I have a definable set, it's certainly definable over M, right? And then all of these are zero, and that's not going to give me what what I want. That's not the right answer for the dimension. But as long as you don't do something like that, um, so as long as we choose a small set. Um, so let's check that. So say A is a subset of B with B also small, uh, contained in M. Now, uh, I can define, just for the sake of this argument, dim B of X and dim A of X, right? Um, and then just by changing A to B here, uh, and clearly, Dimension is not going to go up when I make a bigger set of parameters because these can't go up. Uh, so let's say that this dimension is K, then I can take a witness for that, right? Some point whose dimension over A is K. And, and such an A is called a generic point of X. And let's suppose that the, um, the first K coordinates are independent. Uh, Suppose A1 up to AK are independent over A. So using the fact that my M is saturated, we inductively find some Bs. Which are independent over B, who, such that the type of this over A is the same as the type of this over A. Um. So for instance, if K is one, say, what have you got? This, this type here is just going to be 
determined by all the things that are zero definable, um, sorry, definable for A, which lie above um, little a, below little a. And then in M, there's going to be lots of things in between those. So you take one that's independent from B. Um, and then you just do that again and again. Um, and you, you, so you use saturation to show that they exist. Uh, but then this type knows that this point here is the projection of a point in X. Hence this point here is two. Um, so then each B1 up to BK, sorry, then B1 up to BK extends to B in X. Um, so then B of X is at least K. So I can safely write, write this without an A or B there. Okay, so uh, lemma. Um, so I want to, I'm working towards showing that this is the same as the dimension we had before. So suppose I have a point uh, and, and some small a. then I can characterize um, my point being independent over A topologically. So, um, the coordinates of A are independent over big A, if and only if. Um, Every A definable set that contains that point has interior. Uh, if and only if every A definable um, set X with A and X has non empty. Interior. Um, so proof. Um, okay, so suppose suppose my A's are dependent. Over A. So then say, so say the last one is over BCL of the others together with A. Um, then there is uh, a formula phi with parameters from A. Uh, such that an is the unique um, x with phi of a one up to a n minus one x. So because a n, the singleton a n is definable from those other ones. Uh, so then I want a set that has empty interior that contains my point. I can take a set of points in M to the N such that phi holds and such that um, Xn is unique. 
with with phi of x1 up to xn. Uh, so this set has non-empty interior by uniqueness. Um, sorry, has empty interior. X has empty interior. And a n is in it. A is in it. Uh, I guess you could just also use the graph for a definable function. Um, anyway, so that's the easy direction. Uh, the other direction is not hard, but it uses cell decomposition. Um, so let's do the other direction by induction alone. So let's do the case n is one. Um, so suppose I have a one independent over a. So what does that mean? That means that it doesn't lie in a finite a definable set. Um, So if X is a definable set over A that contains A1, X is infinite, so it contains an open interval, so it has non-empty interior. Um, so if A is an X with A1 in X with uh, X A definable, then X is infinite. So contains an interval. So every um, every subset of M that contains A one has to have non-empty interior. Okay. Um, so let's suppose it's true for M to the N. Um, and then I take my point in m to the m plus one, and the coordinates a one up to a m plus one independent over a. And let's take a definable set that contains that. Um, so suppose x to the m plus x in m to the m plus one is definable over a. Um, and has a in it. So by cell decomposition, they can assume that X is a cell, right? X is a finite union of cells. A is in X, so A must be in one of the cells. Now, I didn't prove this, but if you have, um, if your sets that you cell decompose defined over some set of parameters A, then you can take all the cells to be defined over that set of parameters too. Um, so by cell decomposition, we can assume that not only is X a cell, it's a cell defined over B. Okay. I mean, I didn't really prove cell decomposition, so I certainly didn't prove that. Uh, by cell decomposition, we can suppose that uh, X equals C is a cell defined over A. Um, so what can it be? It's either graph of a function or a space between two graphs of functions. Uh, if C is the graph of F, um, where F maps C prime to M is um, A definable, then, well, then uh, point A lies on that graph. So the M plus first coordinate is F of the rest of them. And then this, this is a definition of A M plus one. 
over A together with A1 up to AN. Um, and this can't happen because A1 up to AN plus one are supposed to be independent. Um, So C can't be the graph of a function, so it must be the space between two graphs of functions. So here F G R M continuous, A definable with F less than G, or we could have one of them being plus or minus infinity. Um, okay, so then my A lies in this space. So that must mean that A1 up to AN lie in the projection. Um, so, um, A1 up to AN, they lie in C prime. Now A1 up to AN plus one are independent over A, and in particular A1 up to AN are independent over A. And C prime is an A definable set that contains them. So it has interior. So it's an open cell. Um, by the inductive hypothesis, C prime is an open cell. And then C is an open cell too. Um, so our original X has non-empty interior. Okay, and then using that, we can show the following. So, um, we have an A definable set um, and some possible dimension for A. Then the dimension of X is at least K. If and only if. Uh, there is a coordinate projection from m to the n to m to the k such that the projection of x has non empty interior. So I think this, this here, like what well, a maximum such K is sometimes called the topological dimension of a set, although there are other notions of that as well. Um, but once you know this, it's an exercise to show that, that this dimension is the same as the one from the previous section. So corollary, I, I was gonna write dim X is dim X, but that's just silly, so like this, DMX agrees with what we had before. I mean, that's not very well formulated, but you know what I mean. So I'll leave that as an exercise and I'll prove this proposition. So you have to show that this, this topological dimension here coincides with what we did, what we did before. Um, so proof of proposition. Uh, okay, so suppose 
dim x is at least k. So then I can take a point in it um, such that there's a k tuple in that point, which is independent over a. Um, uh, and I may as well assume that that k tuple is a1 up to a k. Um, Uh, well, then if I take the projection onto the first k coordinates, a1 up to ak lies in that projection. So by what we just proved, that projection has non-empty interior. Um, let pi from m to the n to m to the k be projection. The first k coordinates. Um, so then a1 up to a k is in pi of x. So by the lemma, pi of x has non empty interior. Okay, and then so for the other direction, um, take um, take some projection which has such that pi of x has non empty interior. Um, and else, I suppose, suppose it's the first k coordinates. Um, then pi of x is a definable, uh, has non empty interior. So it contains um, an open a definable box. Uh, you. Um, and then a bit like we did before, we just use saturation to inductively find um, an A1 in I1, uh, which is independent over A, then an A2 in I2, which is independent over A and I, A1, and so on. So using saturation, inductively take A1, find, a1 up to uh, a, sorry, this should be k, right? Because pi, yeah, pi of x is in m to the k. Um, so we find a1 up to a k in u independent over a. Then that a is in u, which is in the projection. So there's some a1 up to an, but well, some ak plus one up to an, such that the whole tuple a is in our set x. Um, so then take a in x such that pi of x, sorry, pi of a is this thing. Then that witnesses that the dimension of x is at least k.
Okay, so that was like a model theoretic interlude on model theoretic dimension. Uh, so next I'm gonna basically just state some results um, uh, on smooth cell decomposition. And then we'll do, then we'll start on the Peter Wilkie theorem. Um, so let's see, so new page. So, um, so smoothness is this section. Um, so remember we're in a field. Oops, some extra stuff. And so we can use the field structure, um, the ordered field structure to write down like the usual calculus definitions of derivatives. Uh, so for instance, if you have a function of one variable, um, you have some point in its, in its domain and the interior of its domain, you can um, say that's x. You can define the, the, say that the f is differentiable at x, which, if if um, the limit of f of x plus h o minus f of x over h exists, and and then that the value of that limit is the derivative. Um, so using the ordered field structure, uh, we can do kind of well, we can define differentiability. in the usual way. Um, and then you get, the theorem you get, well, the first theorem is, is like um, monotonicity, but in place of continuity, you can assume P times continuous to differentiable for some natural number P. Uh, okay, so suppose F, is definable, and, and I have a natural number R, then F is CR, except at finite value points. Um, so, uh, so how do you prove this? Well, I'll just talk through the proof in the case R is one. Perhaps. So you, um, well, you've got the limit definition of the derivative. Um, now you can look at that. Uh, you can take the limit from below and above. So that gives you two functions, well, which, which exist on some subset of the domain. Um, you can assume f is continuous by monotonicity, and then you you show that if, say, the limit from the right exists and is positive on some interval, then f is strictly increasing. Uh, you show things like that, and then you use those to show that the um, if the two functions, the limit from below and from above, uh, well, you, if they exist, you can assume that they're continuous. Then you show that if they're m-valued, so that is they don't take values in plus or minus infinity, uh, then f is actually differentiable. And then you show that it, f can only, the derivative can only take the value plus or minus infinity at finitely many points. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to write all that down, but um, they, they, you have to do some stuff, but it's not too hard. And it's all in, in Lau's book, <laughs> as is almost everything I've said. Um, uh, okay, once you have that, um, well, then you can do smooth cell decomposition. So um, uh, for that, you need a definition. So uh, perhaps I won't write this down either. So suppose you have a definable set in M to the N. You have to make sense of what it means for a function on it to be CR. 
Um, and you can just do that when, when you don't know that your definable set's open. But you just do that by saying that there's some open set containing your set uh, and a CR function on that definable function on that set whose restriction to your set is your given function. And then once you've done that, you can define CPCR cells. Uh, so uh, CR cells are defined um, exactly as cells were, but requiring all the functions involved. To be CR. Um, and then you get smooth cell decomposition. And I'll state this because we're going to use it. Um, so R is a natural number. Then there are two parts, just like in cell decomposition. So it says the assumptions are the same. So you have finitely many definable sets in M to the N. Then there's a cell decomposition compatible with those, such that all the cells in your cell decomposition are CR. Uh, and then there's a the second part, where it's just like for functions, um, just like for normal cells, you've got functions are piecewise continuous. Now you get that piecewise CR. So if f from x to m is definable, uh, x and m to the n, then there is a cell decomposition. into CR cells such that F restricted to C is CR for each C in B uh, with C compared to X. Um, so I'm not going to prove this. I'll just say that you, you prove it by induction. So you, you might be quite a positive for each of these. Um, and, and at the same time, you prove a third thing. So like in our proof of cell decomposition, we proved that the set of, for the second one, when you have a function, we proved that the set of points at which that function is continuous uh, was dense in, in, in the set X. You prove a similar thing now, but for derivatives existing. Um, and you, so you put that in between the two. Um, and uh, yeah, then then the, the, the proof's not it's not as hard as the actual cell decomposition because you can use actual cell decomposition constantly to help you prove it. Um, okay, then I'll just finish by saying uh, something I'm not going to talk about, but like I'll just say it. So then you've got a like now suppose your 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 structure is on the real field, like it's an expansion of the real field. Um, you can ask like. Can you improve this R here? I mean, can you take C infinity or analytic? And the answer to both of those is no. Um, so I guess the answer to analytic is due to Roland Spider and Wilkie, but um, this implies it. So the guy and Roland gave an um, O minimal structure on the real field. Uh, which doesn't have C infinity cell decomposition. Um, where, where that's defined in the obvious way. Um, although, okay, so yeah, so that's what they, so you can't assume C infinity cell decomposition, but then most, most structures you kind of bump into have C infinity cell decomposition. If you've kind of, yeah, if you haven't set out to prove that you, you don't have it in general, then you often have it. Um, 
okay so that's the kind of that's the end of like the first part of the course on just minimality so next time i'll start talking about peter wilkie um, thank you thanks <laughs> thank Stop you the thanks <laughs>